I mean, they put this up here for me, right? <clears throat> I want to start out by thanking Father Costello, and I think Father Fitch had a lot to do with this, uh, June Roca, and everyone else who's joined in and put this whole series together that's been held here at Epiphany Cathedral, relating to the situation we find ourselves in, but relating to religious freedom, our rights vis-a-vis -vis who we are as faith-filled individuals. Tonight, what I want to talk a little bit about, talk for a little while about, is the HHS mandate. <clears throat> I realize that you've had others present in different contexts. What I would like to do tonight is talk a little bit about the mandate, particularly some of the difficulties found with the mandate, and then to take any questions you might have. Um, my point about questions is I could stand up here and talk for a long, long time. I suppose, it, and not address something that you wanted to speak about or hear about. So I will talk for a little while, and then we'll switch it out there, and I'll respond to your questions. Um, I think we can say that, that we've been barraged with claims that the HHS mandate is about women's rights. And I want to start out by talking about that. And the whole concept of women's rights, I agree with. We must, in a sense, anyone who's discriminated against it and the possibilities they have in their life. However, I don't define women's rights solely uh, in terms of contraception or abortion or something like this. They're much bigger as to who a person is. Um, I think what we have to do is talk about this whole idea in our civil law that rights to obtain free abortion, causing drugs and other evils, we're told trumps the rights of anyone else, of maybe a Catholic business or a Catholic institution, which objects to providing these things. You know, I think we find ourselves in a situation today in our culture where we have dueling rights. Someone has defined, this is my right. Someone else has said, this is my right over here, and they conflict. And it does create a problem. I do think we have to look at the fact that our society has had ways over history to address the situations when they arose. For some reason, much of that has been set aside. Now we find our situation in where, um, you know, we, as a society, that is our country, historically has a good re reputation, and I think a good record, for dealing with rights of minorities. And in our culture today, I have to say, we as Catholics, uh, we're a minority. Certainly our institutions are in our own culture. We're having trouble getting heard. We continue to speak for minorities ourselves. In the introduction, it was noted I was at the Vatican Mission to the UN for a number of years. We dealt a lot with rights of minorities throughout the world. I never thought, and I was always very proud because I was an American. There, okay, we're doing well, we have a lot of freedoms in our country. I never really thought I would find myself in a situation where I have to deal because of minority and being discriminated against. And not only discriminated against, but then being said, and now you will pay for these things that truly offend you. So I think we have to be attentive to that. Uh, I do believe we find ourselves in our country at this time where we have an administration that argues that it is now necessary to oblige individuals and religious institutions to provide abortion-causing drugs, sterilization, and contraceptives in health plan for their employees. One of the main arguments for the proponents of the mandate is the false idea that no one will be forced to buy contraception. I wish that this were true. And if it were true, the government would not have X number of entities and individuals suing them at this time. I think all of you listened the other night uh, to the debates between the vice president's candidates. And at the end, there was the discussion on the issue of what was to be forced to pay and what not. And our present vice president said, you know, no one is going to have to pay for these things. It's simply not true. It's simply not true. Because at the same time, the Health and Human Services Department has issued mandates telling us as Catholic institutions that if it's August 
2013, if we don't have everything in place, they've told us exactly the scale of fines that will kick in and at what rate. And then to have a representative stand up there in television and say that, I was kind of dumbfounded. Earlier in the month, we know that there was a judge case in Missouri, uh, a, a, a case in Missouri where the judge dismissed a case against the HHS mandate, ruling that forcing Catholics to pay for contraceptive and abortion-inducing drugs does not violate our faith. Does not violate our faith. Again, this judge told us that as Catholics, what does and what does not violate our faith. And that is not the legal's professional role. They are to understand the law, and they are to understand the principles that support the law, and how the law functions. They are not to define what makes me Catholic, and what does qualifies me as not being Catholic. And that's where I think the huge violation has come. Basically, and I'll talk a little bit more about it, and I get into it a little bit earlier here, we have an identity theft going on here. Where I understand that, first of all, I grew up and was taught by my parents, as many of you here were, you would be here, what it was to be Catholic. Then we went to different schools. Some of you talked to me before you went to Catholic schools. In my case, I went on and did some other theological studies. And now someone is telling me, and you, that what is Catholic and not Catholic? That's not acceptable. That has never happened before in our country. You are allowed by the government right now to be Catholic for Sunday worship. That is what religious freedom means. Since they have not closed down churches, then we have religious freedom in this country. That is not religious freedom and religious liberty. That's the right to worship. And that's been around for a long time. Some of you may know, I, I spent a, before I was in the seminary, uh, and when I was younger, I'll just leave it that way, a number of years I worked in the Soviet Union. And it was then literally that, Soviet Union. Now I go to high schools and I can't say that. I have to say, I lived and worked in Russia. Then they understand. But it's Soviet Union. In their constitution, they had a lot of discussion about religious liberty, religious freedom, and worship. In reality, it didn't exist. I'm fearful at what I see sometimes. Because we also have these things in our constitution and written it in government documents. But I am fearful at times that where is it going to lead? When does it stop? Um, one of the, from time to time, working there for a long period, I would get called in, and they would tell you uh, protocol wanted to speak with us. It wasn't protocol at all. Uh, it was KGB. Okay, the, and they kept track of people who were working there. And usually it was not a terribly unpleasant experience. I went in, I knew what to say, and we had our conversation. The last time, uh, not the last time before I got a different promotion with another company, but I was called in, the whole discussion was, uh, why did I go to church? And at one point I, I noted that in their law, they had these rights and that I said, you know, you follow me around, you know I don't break your law. And the fellow said, I don't care about your church and what you do, why do you go to our church? Because when I was through, went to Catholic Mass on Sunday, went to the Mass, um, I still had time in the day, and usually the Russian Orthodox services were a little bit later. And I was trying to learn the language and the culture, and I had an interest in religion. I would go to their church. Made them furious. The guy just went ballistics. Why would I do that? And I replied by saying I was happy that he was so proud of his church. You know, that, that he would, you know, uh, wonder why I would be attracted by it. It was not a pleasant meeting, to be honest with you. I thought I was dumb. I thought, because it was not an uncommon thing where they expelled somebody. Um, and I thought, oh, they're going to boot me. And, you know, I sent the letter back to the company. Uh, at that time, there were no emails and things like that. So it took a little while. Well, nothing happened, and I filed the complaint about the way I had been interviewed. My whole point in telling that story is, 
we must be vigilant in our lives. And to be honest with you, maybe if I hadn't had some of those experiences, I would not be so alarmed by what I see today. Because I'll tell you right away, my time in the Soviet Union, I enjoyed being there. I enjoyed learning the language. Uh, I wanted to learn it. I had some graduate studies in planned economies and communist societies and things. I enjoyed seeing it. Their literature is beautiful and the traditions, but the government was very tough and very limiting in freedoms. I am concerned when I see that happen in our own country. Um, concerned, I hope, with no basis for that concern. But just the same, I think at times when we see change happening quickly and forced into slots and government telling you who you are and what rights you have and don't have, that's extremely dangerous. That is a slippery slope, no matter how you look at it. Um, I noted that there was this judge in Missouri I spoke about, the same judge graciously informed the Catholic Church that funding and providing abortion-inducing drugs and other evils is not a sin because, she wrote, Catholics remain free to exercise their religion by not using contraceptives. So that was the flip side. But we must pay for everyone else's. For many in our nation, religion is clearly not seen, is seen, sorry, as a private, quaint little hobby. And if it agrees with what's going on, you can have your hobby. You are allowed to do that. Once again, I don't think that's it. Uh, my faith for me is not a hobby. I think it isn't for most of you. I've seen you here many times or other parishes in the diocese, and that's good. Faith is not a hobby. And I don't want someone treating me as, you know, I'm the, when I exercise my faith, I'm playing chess, or I belong to a, you know, running club or something. It's not it at all. It's more than that. It strikes at our very being of who we are and who we are called to be. Recently, Pope Benedict was speaking about the subject of religious liberty. And in this regard, he said the following, and he said it to a group of American bishops. It is inconceivable, then, that believers should have to suppress a part of themselves, their faith, in order to be active citizens. In response to that, I say, bravo, Holy Father. But at the same time, I say, the word is out, obviously. And I think it's a shame for our country. Um, this man, our present Holy Father, lived through a Germany that was problems for the rest of Europe and the world. Let's just be blunt about it. And a government that started very early at just chipping away at some things, and the church was told, no, this is no affair of yours. No, you don't belong in this. No, this isn't religion. Go away. No, you don't have a right to speak out on this. I think we have to be cautious. A second claim made by supporters of the HHS mandate is that this is about Catholic bishops banning contraceptives. It's not about contraceptives. We know it. Contraceptives have been around for a long time, and yes, the church has spoken out and has a defined position. And I'm not going to run from it. It's there. It is what it is. And I believe it's a solid, rational position with a vision for the human person. But this HHS mandate is not about that subject. And continually it goes, oh, the church and the bishops, you know, they're against women. That's it. Because they're not in favor of contraception. As Catholics, we can respond to this by affirming this is not about the Catholic Church wanting to force anybody to do anything. It is instead, in our situation, the federal government forcing, even coercing, the church to act against her core teachings and, in a sense, to act the faithful, ask the faithful to do the same. Others may do as they wish, but the issue of the state telling the church how a Catholic must act is unacceptable. The government, in a sense, has changed the rules on religious freedom and is in the process of redefining exactly what that freedom is. 
The present administration has attempted very clearly to separate freedom of worship from freedom of religion or religious liberty. In short, the government now rules that as long as Catholic business owners can go to worship in church, there is no constitutional violation on what they're made to pay for or what they're asked to do. A third argument that supporters of the mandate assert is that contraception is used by most women, including supposedly 98% of Catholic women. We've all heard this figure. How do you respond to this? I'd like to say two things. First, it's irrelevant. It is irrelevant to a discussion of religious liberty and religious freedom that one component is picked out. So, my response initially, irrelevant to the topic. We're talking about religious liberty. Okay, you want to engage in the argument? Fine, I'll do that. This number is presented in a truly misleading way. First, if a survey found that 98% of people cooperated in some evil act that's determined by some group, why should the government then force 100% of the people to do so? I don't know. Uh, the logic isn't there for me. Secondly, this often cited study manipulates the data to create a false impression. The study actually says that contraceptive is used, uh, excuse me, is Contraceptive use is 98% among sexually experienced Catholic women. This, the number is going to come down. And it can have a significant impact on the overall statistic here. That is a big difference. A fourth assertion by proponents of the HHS mandate is the following. Does the church support the idea that all deserve health care? If you go back to when the uh, whole discussion started on what's called Obamacare, the Bishops' Conference did speak up and say that the situation we found in our country vis-a-vis -vis those who were able to enter and receive health care, enter our kind of mean the marketplace to receive health care, it had to be addressed because we had a whole strata of people who could not. There were some social services available where they did receive assistance. But what the bishops objected to from the very beginning was the whole point about abortion and that the immigrants arriving to this country, whether they had documents or not, would receive no care. That is, technically a child would be given no care. We know that when these individuals went into care facilities, they were taken care of. But you might ask, who took care of them then? Um, when I was in seminary formation, so now I take myself back to about 1986, uh, as noted from the Diocese of Green Bay in Wisconsin, we had to do something called clinical pastoral experience, CPE. I had to go work in a hospital. The school year in Europe goes much later than the school year here. But it was required in my diocese that every seminarian do this hospital experience. At that time, there was a program in New York City. So there were three of us from my class who were studying together when we went into the program. We had no idea what we were going to do or what, you know, I, I didn't know too much about a hospital. I think I would need to get my wisdom teeth taken out one time because my parents' insurance paid it. So we went there to work. At that time, the situation we found ourselves in, the Catholic hospitals in New York City were the only ones who would treat AIDS patients. No one knew what would happen. Uh, staffs in the public hospitals or city hospitals refused to treat them, wouldn't go into the rooms. The Catholic hospitals took them in and thus, that's where they came. So that was my kind of introduction. Why do I tell that whole story? Because that's the situation of how the Catholic hospitals responded to a need of a population that now, if you could say it, it's almost in vogue if you work with them, okay, then nobody would. The Catholic hospitals did. Today, under the HHS mandate, my friends, what the church is being told is if you're going to take care of these 
patients, if you went back to them with AIDS, first of all, they must be Catholic, principally. They'll allow a few others in. You ask the number, it's very difficult to get a percent. They must be Catholic. They must hold your similar beliefs. Now define that. Hold similar beliefs. On what? Well, they just say beliefs. Okay. Uh, does that mean if they don't believe in some authority, that the government can then, if they say, well, I don't believe uh, in the Immaculate Conception, does the government have the right to say, okay, they don't qualify, they're not yours? Under the present HHS mandate, where Catholic institutions are being told, you will have to now buy this insurance, and you will have to do this for all years. First of all, they said, well, there's an exemption. I think that came up maybe briefly in that vice presidential debate. Um, Jesus Christ and his apostles would not have meant the exemption because they were preaching to non-Catholics. That's who they were helping. They weren't Catholics, it was a Jewish population and non-believers. They would not have qualified. And they might see them, come on, that's a little extreme. Well, we have a number, uh, first of all, our schools. I spoke about our hospitals to give an example. Many of our schools have non-Catholic students in them. Um, sorry, uh, in a sense then, that is not serving our own. Some of us here are of a certain age. Can you imagine back in the early 60s, if we had said, uh, by the way, we're setting up all these social services and we're only going to serve our own people. How would that have been received in society at the time? Um, some of us lived through the 70s also, when everything, everyone had to be included in everything. And, okay, and the church, the mission always has been. Christ didn't say, go out and take care of our own. You know, it was go out and preach to all nations. And in that invocation was to help our brothers and sisters in need, whoever they were. But they're telling us now, if you run the soup pantry, you know, and somebody comes, or a pantry of some kind of soup kitchen, I have to almost ask, you know, excuse me, could I see your baptismal certificate? <laughs> Why? Because I have to justify that I'm serving only my own kind. I think even that the vocabulary is repulsive, at least to me, because it's not who we are. But once again, in a very subtle way, and sometimes not so subtle, we are being told who we are. Okay, we've said we'd serve everyone. The Lord sent us into the world. To me, that is identity theft. You know, we, f we hear about this all the time. Somebody steals your wallet, you know, and you hope you can stop the credit cards in time. But if not, if somebody, worse yet, they, they get your bank account number, or they get one of your checks or something, it can be a lot more serious. And I hope it doesn't ha hasn't happened to anyone. But it's what's happening to us today. Because that identity of who we are, how we have always defined ourselves, is out. And I think I can say honestly, we're being very much targeted as Catholics. It's not being done to the, the Baptists per se. Who runs because why? Who runs schools and hospitals, social service agencies? The second largest provider after the government in this country of social services is the Catholic Church. It's partly in recognition of what has been done historically in terms of hospitals, schools, social services, orphanages when they had them, and the list goes on and on. That's why the exemption existed. That's why the consideration over time existed. Because the agencies did contribute so much to society as a whole. And now we're being told, a little, even though we are who we are, we're being told, well, you can't do that anymore. Because we don't think that's who you are. I don't know about you, but since I was about that high, I didn't like it when somebody told me I couldn't do something. My mother, if she were here, would tell you that clearly. <laughs> but I didn't like it when somebody told me I wasn't who I knew I was. We shouldn't like it anymore at our age either. I want to take care of everyone, regardless of their faith. If they are in need, we need to address that. And that's what this HHS mandate is about. 
our freedom to continue to do as we have done, continue to be who we are, along with the beliefs that we have that are the foundation of our faith. The last point I kind of had down here, and I already kind of addressed that, was that somehow churches are exempt from this. To this point, they are not. Because that, if you have a very small, I come from Wisconsin, some of the churches have closed there. Here we're building churches, it's totally different. However, can you still hear me? I'm not sure what's happening with this mic. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. In Wisconsin, they're having to close some of the churches. We build them here. So close to each other, I'm not happy. Um, my whole point is there, you might have a parish where um, Maybe there's a priest there and uh, a secretary, part-time. And so they're very small. Father is likely a little bit long in years because a young priest is at a larger parish. They don't have active social services at the parish. They may be, the parish is quite small. They may qualify. They may be able to be exempt under uh, this very specific exemption that exists. Otherwise, in, down in a state like Florida, where the parishes are really quite large, where there is a staff, some paid, some volunteers, they're not going to qualify for the exemption at all. It's going to be very difficult. And the so-called accommodation that was supposedly given when the church first expressed its concern over this, it's not accommodation at all. Because all it did was just, you know, that very small segment might get through it. They could say, in fact, okay, there's an accommodation. In reality, it wasn't there. Um, my intention was to talk for a little while, but like I said, I could talk a long time and might not answer the questions you have. So at this time, I would like to open the floor to questions. There'll be a microphone uh, brought around. So if you want to ask a question, raise your hand, and we'll take it from there. First, I'd just like to say thank you for coming out here and speaking with us. Um, we, we see throughout church documents, and especially the catechism, that we as Catholics have a moral obligation to be politically active. To be politically active, does that also encompass voting? Do we have a moral obligation as Catholics to cast a ballot? The church is not defined it with the word vote. It has left that there is an obligation there uh, for Catholics to be involved in the political system, um, to stand up. You know, so often, and I appreciate it, and I hear it, you know, you bishops just aren't speaking out on this issue or that issue. Um, we all have the same moral obligation. Okay, one might have a different role or authority within that structure, but everyone has the moral obligation. It hasn't been defined as voting because in some countries it's done much differently. Maybe uh, they vote for representatives and then they elect the president. Okay, but they vote at a much different level. In our country, basically, the ultimate way to participate in the political domain of the country is voting. Um, some countries, depending where you are and you're Catholic, you may not have the right to vote. Okay, some of the uh, the strongly, heavily Muslim countries exempt their minorities from that. And next of all, they're barely voting anyway because they have a kingdom. Saudi Arabia is a prime example. Um, it, it, has, it just passes on from these various families within the country. But still the church would encourage those individuals, they have the moral obligation to be as involved as the system allows. For us, that's voting. I hope that answers your question. Okay. I have heard 
discussion that um, if the HSA mandate is not modified, that the Catholic hospitals, for example, may, they've threatened or promised, I'm not sure which, to shut down. Do you see that truly happening? And if so, do you, do you just see them reopening under a different name with the same employees, or would there truly be an impact? I don't know. I can say back in the, um, what was it, late 50s, early 60s, when some of the Catholic schools were trying to get busing, uh, in Philadelphia, if you remember, the Cardinal closed all the schools, some of us do, and marched all his kids over to the public school and said, here, they're yours. <laughs> and they went, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Okay, there were huge numbers then. Okay, but in terms of the Catholic hospitals, um, I don't have an answer for you on that. First of all, we don't own a hospital. Uh, the ch Catholic Church doesn't here in this diocese. Um, there is no Catholic hospital in the diocese. There were sisters who had it earlier. Uh, they sold them. Uh, but dioceses who have them and own them, you know, they'll have to, they'll have to address that. Uh, but they've had difficulties all along with some of the other mandates on hospitals where it kind of started. And maybe we should have done that a while ago, and we wouldn't find ourselves where we are today, to have said early on, no, not going to do that. Um, some tried to restructure. I'm not certain in the end it was very helpful. Uh, there were canon lawyers who were very good at how to illegally restructure the, we call them temporal goods in canon law, when you own a physical something. And they restructured how these temporal goods were, um, were incorporated, in a sense, within the church. And uh, okay, it allowed for certain things. Why? We, otherwise they weren't going to get state assistance and couldn't keep prices maybe where they were. Um, we'll see what happens uh, on that issue. Uh, I would say it's an option. And you would say, well, some people might say, and I've had it said, well, that's terrible, you couldn't do that. Okay, we'll see. Um, I, it's not the first I'd want to turn to, but sometimes when you're given no choice, you must make the statement, as the Cardinal did a long time ago in Philadelphia. Yes, because in the sense that you have the hospitals in an association, the Catholic hospitals, uh, but they're owned independently, and sometimes they're owned also by religious communities. That is, it could be a hospital where the bishop might be on the board, but he's not ahead of it. It's owned by the Sisters of Loretto, for example. They own the, the Catholic hospital network. Bishop, I think you've done a good job of explaining this position, particularly the church's position. But Thank you. What I'm wondering about is why we don't get this message repeated at Mass on Sundays. There's a lot of people come here that aren't here tonight, an awful lot of people, and we talk about other things that are important. But part of every sermon could be devoted to explain this to people that go to Mass on Sundays that aren't going to be here for audience like this that need to hear this message. We really want to get a lot of Catholic support. You've got to explain that position clearly to all of these. Is there some legal concerns about losing our exemption or something? I have a difficult time understanding. No, um, I don't have a legal concern about losing the exemption. I'll be very blunt on that last part, and then I'll go back to your first part, okay? I'm not going to ignore it. The last part about the exemption. What we can do, and some of you I know would like us to do, would say, vote for X, do not vote for Y. Uh, that we cannot do. But I can say to you, uh, vote yes on Amendment 6 and yes on Amendment 8. That I can do legally and I have absolutely no problem uh, in this whole... Uh, more has been made out of this whole tax status, you're afraid to do this because you lose your tax status, than is really there. It, it's kind of, oh, you don't do anything because you're afraid to lose your tax status. It's an easy thing to throw at somebody. Uh, it, it isn't the case. Um, First part of your question concerns me more. I'll level with you on that. Um, you know, we've, um, I don't know how many of you see the diocesan newspaper. We've done a lot the last eight weeks, I would say, in the paper, letters by myself, but also articles on other aspects leading up to this election. We've had, we've been present at some rallies, not the organizers always, but part of them, 
Some of these signs have come from different ones. I think I held that sign. Um, we put a lot in something that goes out to all the parish. It's called the Mustard Seed. The Mustard Seed is kind of the, this publication that goes out that tells all the parishes, this is what's going on in the diocese. Here's where you find some on um, Catholics voting. Here's where you find something about the HHS mandate and what can be done. Parishes are to pick that up then and reproduce it in their bulletins. Or in some cases, we put attachments with it where they can take that, reproduce it, uh, put it at the back of church, put it in the bulletin. Um, we also have through our website, for those of you who, who use that form of the media, um, where you could go online, many of these things are repeated there directly for the individual to have access to. Um, the priests have access to all the same thing. Um, they're encouraged to, to preach on this. There are some who maybe justifiably say, and I'll say this, justifiably say, uh, listen, I think you have to talk about the gospel message. I, I, I'm not here to put out a political message. Um, okay, and I respect that. I think sometimes the two intersect, uh, and they intersect clearly at different times, and we have to adapt that, and I think circumstances may call for a different approach at any one time, where you might be, okay, this is my feeling, okay, I'm gonna change that now. Um, I'll be very blunt. Um, up to about a year ago, I probably wouldn't have done as much as I did to this point. Maybe some of you feel I've done far too little. Believe me, people stop and tell me I've done far too much, but I'm not gonna go there. However, um, I think it has to be done. The situation warrants it. I think you've heard that from me tonight. We just have to stand up. We just have to be counted for who we are. I think it's not a time where we can indicate um, it's somebody else's job. Unless we're there, uh, then it is. But if we're not there, then it's my job. You know, all of our job. We can't look to somebody else, look to ourselves, and then move on that. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, you mentioned the slippery slope. Uh, I was wondering if you think these people have an, an ultimate goal beyond the HHS mandate. I didn't see that movie. What is it, 2016 or something? <laughs> I didn't see it yet, so I don't know. Um, yeah, I think so. I'll just answer your question very bluntly. I do think so. I think one would be naive to, to say it any other way or to think about it another way. I, I think politically, I would like to think of it in another way. Um, I told you I spent a number of years with the Vatican delegation to the United Nations. And there, uh, probably, we dealt with issues like this probably 10 years, no, it was 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, and I used to think, you know, thank God I live where I live. It's not there anymore. You know, it's changed. So, uh, where's it going? I look to where some of those issues ended up. And, um, when we would speak out at the United Nations, you had lots of different countries represented, uh, you know, different opinions. Western Europe probably wasn't so supportive. But what always encouraged me, some country might come over and say, representative, because you, you got to know the people very well personally. I don't necessarily agree with what you say, but we are all the richer because you're here and you say it. Think about that when you think somebody's going to slap back at you. Don't worry about it. Somebody will. But my point is, they would say, I don't necessarily always agree with your position, but we're all better off because you're here and you say it, and we hear it. Uh, do they always agree? No. Get beat up badly sometimes, yes. But that's all right. You still went in the next day and had it to repeat. So I do think there's a slippery slope. Uh, and I think you started to slide. So uh, the whole point is you gotta dig in, and you gotta begin to go back up the slope. And you're gonna gain sometimes, and you're going to lose a little ground sometimes, 
But you must keep trying, or you'll just keep going down. Very happy with this program um, First of all, let me say I find it incredulous that we're all here tonight. I never in my wildest dreams thought there'd ever be a time that I'd participate in a congregation like this where we're talking about defending the freedoms that came to us from God. And from my perspective, the reason we're here is because there are a whole group of people in this country who have turned away from the United States principles. So my question to you is, if by the grace of God, we do have a good outcome at the, ne at the next election, do we then go back to sleep? Do the American bishops put this aside and let it go away? Or do we continue? Because I remember remembering my history that things like this happened in, in Germany. And our, and our southern neighbor in Mexico, thousands of priests were beheaded by socialists. And I just believe it can happen here. I think no place is exempt from any of this. And it's called evil, by the way. We don't speak about this anymore, do we, very much? But that's what it's called, and we have to recognize that. We have to recognize good, too. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we just got to go around looking for evil. We have to recognize good. But the point you say, um, I don't think there's, going, there's any going back, uh, no matter what happens. I think we're going to have to keep going forward with this, because there, there is that other movement, you know, to, on that slippery slope that we just talked about. It's there. So we, we have to keep working. And um, progress will be made and certain issues will be come out maybe not the way we want. Uh, but from there, put it back together and go forward. And I, I think we have to do it as, if you'll excuse my reference as happy warriors. Because <laughs> we need to be people of hope. We are people of hope. It's our faith. And you good people wouldn't be here if you didn't have that. So it's the root of who we are. You, uh, there was a great, and I don't have the exact quote from Thomas Jefferson, who spoke about this very fact when he was talking about the fact of religious freedom. And he said, this isn't, uh, and I'm not quoting directly now, so forgive me if I may, but the gist was, this isn't anything we're doing, this is from God. So, um, you know, we, we, this freedom of religion isn't something that is the government's to grant or deny. Um, I'm going to say it here, it's mine. It's yours. God gave it to you and He gave it to me. And everyone else here. It's not anybody else. school with John Rayner, college with John Rayner. I also grew up with a young lady in Cincinnati by the name of Kathleen Gilligan. Kathleen Gilligan was the daughter of uh, Governor John Gilligan, Democratic, conservative governor of the state of Ohio, now known as Kathleen Sebelius. To say that I am angry with my church, I am not. I am disappointed in my church. I love my church. I live my faith. I'm tired of turning the other cheek. I want someone to step forward and fight for my rights, my wife's rights, everyone's right. I want a spokesperson because the liberal media has never got a print. I want to fight. Please, please. I'll go to the ballot box. Please fight. You have a deal. No, I don't mean to just dismiss your question for that. I, you have a deal, but I'm going to repeat one thing. Um, I will go and fight for your wife's rights and your rights, and you go fight for them too. And you fight for the rights of the person next to you and mine. We'll do it together, all of us.
think he's trying to get into you. Here he comes. Thank you very much, Bishop. I agree with you and everybody here. I think like you say, we are in this for the fight. And just for the simple things that we're afraid to confront anybody because we're afraid we're going to hurt feelings or they're going to be mad at us, we can't be that way anymore. We have to go forward. I think like in my parish, I've been asking them ushers to give out the Florida Catholic. You know, and we're sitting there, a lot of people go by and they all the right to life, respect to life materials are laying there, trying to give them to people, they don't take them, they say they're free, you know, and I think we have to come forth like that to be more aggressive. I think we Catholics have polarized ourselves over the years, we've been satisfied with our schools and our parishes, and now we're on the defense, and we've got to fight. And I appreciate very much you taking the stand you have, because there's many who aren't, many bishops who aren't. We, have, we all have a role to play. Um, pick up those newspapers. And our, our Right to Life, director of our Right to Life here in the diocese, she's here tonight. Jean, why don't you stand up? Most of the people know her. Um, she'd love it if you pick up those things and hand them out. Then she's going to come and ask me for more money to buy more of it, but that's okay. I will. The priests, and there's some priests here, uh, I don't think these are many who are for it. I'm just going to say that. Do they speak against it maybe as much as they could or should? Um, you've kind of told me that no, they probably don't. Um, and that's not me, I'm just picking that up here. Um, some of the other organizations, you might talk about a congressman or a state representative. And I'll write to them. And I'll say, you know, I, I have this area, 10 counties, Southwest Florida, you're the, um, you know, your position on this, I, I'm not quite clear. Uh, the position of the church is the following. Um, and they're Catholic, you know. And, okay, sometimes I get an answer back, respectful. Most times it's not, if they're going to be just, they just don't answer. But I'll write again. Uh, a few will come see me and we'll have the conversation. Why? Because I think it's key with them. They are voting. Now, do many people know that, you know, I had contact or whatever, whatever? No. Um, that I don't think is helpful. I don't think it's the best way to get them. Uh, you know, sometimes at the end they'll say, you know, you made a good point. I see you. I, I think about this or look at it another way. 
Uh, the hardest thing to combat is somebody comes in and said, well, um, you know, I know a person who, and you just fill it all in. Um, recently, I, I uh, had a chance, it was a red mass, to talk to lawyers, and I was talking about the law, and in getting ready for this homily, I kind of was looking at media, because several have mentioned media here tonight, and, and the media has a way of looking at these things, and it was very interesting. We're talking about law, and freedom, and rights, and suddenly it was clear to me, the media doesn't talk about the principles behind the law anymore. They talk about principles. It's, it's human stories. Um, sometimes they're feel-good things, sometimes they're terribly sad in the life of a human being, and it goes, that's why that person had to, you know, and it's something maybe we wouldn't agree with. Um, but we have to have principles behind who we are. And our laws did when they were created. Certainly our Constitution did. And it's clearly indicated what they were, particularly in the area of religious freedom. And, you know, in a sense, it was to keep the government out uh, of religion and leave it to the citizens to practice, not to penalize, not to define who you or I are religiously. But uh, that aspect comes in. Um, you know, we talked a lot about the HHS mandate. It, it's really an overreach of the law. You know, and I think we have some, uh, this kind of isn't part of the topic tonight, but I'm going to get to it anyway. We have overreach there. We have another overreach in same-sex marriage. Um, I have the greatest respect for every human being, and that's what God calls you and I to do. I disagree with somebody tremendously because of the way they live their life. And it's the act we have to dislike, not the person, ever. Not the person. We're called to love one another. But those are two cases where I think the law so overreaches what it was to do. Then we have the other where the law, in a sense, defaults. That is, it's on the life of the unborn child. The law there pulls back. There it defaults completely. Um, why? I think it's because the principles aren't seen for the law anymore. It's just the human story that's been told over and over again. And the principles have been pushed out. And you might say morals, okay. In, in a church way, we'd call it morals. Out, out in science, principles and ethics. Uh, but laws really, there's principles that must come behind them. They're not there anymore. It's us, the law chooses to overreach. Uh, I think I heard Today or yesterday, someplace they ruled on DOMA again, uh, and an appellate ruled against it. It'll go to the Supreme Court. But just the same, there's a case where I just think, there's a law that says it, and so the legal system defaults on it. Thank you, Bishop, again. Uh, I just have a question. Uh, when Obamacare was being discussed, before it was passed. There were a lot of people on television talking about different aspects of it. And it was a Catholic sister. I think everybody had seen her. I can't remember her name. But she was very adamant that everything that was in this program was good. In effect, the way she was putting it across, like she was representing the Catholic Church. And so a lot of people who can see by this to her and say, oh, it's the old thing. She's a Catholic. She's up there. She's a Catholic. And she spoiled this. And yet you know that what, what was being legislated was not. It was in our faith. Now, how is that allowed to happen? And that's the question. When I talk to my friends about it, they said, she's up there saying it's good because we've had to push the loose it. I said, I don't think so. But how, how, how do you fight that? Um, even in the church, she has rights to speak up. We get, we're telling, we don't have them. But, okay, I don't think uh, church authorities ever said she represented the views. I know who you were referring to. I, and I know her. Personally. Yes, the media can say that. And why? Because the media has an agenda. They have somebody who agrees and away they go. 
Now, in fairness, if we have the same person, but I'm not going to say the name, because I'm not certain we do. If it's the same one, she later came out when the HHS mandate came out and said, no, that's not what was agreed to. That's specific, and in a sense she had a certain credibility. When she had been with them, she then realized she got duped and came out and said, no, that's not what we agreed to. So, in a way, um, okay, I think it did tremendous damage initially. Um, you know, churches had scandal at different times. That's scandal of another sort, too. Yeah, it is. Um, there were components that were there. I think the, the thing that was most unfortunate is, is, you know, some of the components could have been gotten out of that and everybody knew it. And the, the vote was very close at one point in time. And they said, no, it does not have anything to do with abortion. Uh, when in reality, it did. So the, the point was just that they said an extension to that question Notre Dame had. They, um, I went to Notre Dame. When I first entered the seminary, I had no theology and no philosophy, not a credit. And some of the priests standing around know what that means. <laughs> yeah. So I went for one straight year of philosophy and I was sent to Notre Dame. I enjoyed that year immensely. It was the best year of my life, I just didn't know it then. <laughs> Eat, sleep, and pray, and study a little bit. Um, However, when, when all that happened and when the degree was given stuff, I've, I've written so many letters to that university that probably they said, oh, here he comes again. <laughs> and some of the priests I know well because they were studying at the time that I was there. And uh, I just said, you know, what are you doing? But at the same time, in fairness to Notre Dame, they're one of the entities suing over the HHS mandate. They're suing the government. So, uh, I, was at mass. <clears throat> I was at mass this morning. Good. And after the, uh, <laughs> I think that's a good way to start a day. <laughs> yeah. And after after the uh, homily, the priest had a message, and he quoted the present vice president of the United States, Joe Biden, Christian Catholic, uh, Irish Catholic, uh, on his position on the HHS position on there will be no payments, etc. And he said, this is a fact. That's what Joe Biden said. The priest said, it's not a fact. And he quoted the accurate HHS uh, situation, and he said, that is a fact. And the congregation clapped and cheered. Now, why can't we have more things like that without mentioning a name? He mentioned the policy, and he said, it's not a fact. We're being lied to, and he, this priest stood up to it and said it. Maybe it's coming from the bishops, but I got another question. Go ahead. Uh, how, can, how, can, uh, how can a Catholic vote for someone that is pro abortion? How can they do that? I don't know. <laughs> no, but I, I hear your question, I understand it. To me, I, I don't know, all right? I really don't. Um, but obviously it's happening, okay? And statistics tell us, <laughs> statistics tell us it's being done. Um, there are a couple principles out there that, okay, the church has always put a primacy on life and the evil uh, of taking of innocent life. You have, there's a few competing doctrines. Um, I don't know if some of you read what I wrote on, uh, about life in the letter I wrote in the Florida Catholic. Uh, there's a quote in there from the Holy Spirit. Thank you. I'll pay you later. Pay you later. There was a, a quote, uh, there was a point in the letter that really comes from uh, John Paul II, who was really, you know, the gospel of life came from him. But it really, it's talked about the political situation when you have a competing and what situations do you take and to the what should I say untrained ear it sounds that it's very uh, forgiving and allowing it really does but it's the strongest position that was stated clearly in the encyclical that he wrote in the Gospel of Life that talked about it but was also 
later put in the one that was done to laity on their political responsibility. And it talked about precisely that. How do you vote for someone on this? And it looked, you know, um, I'm going to go back to what I said to you, brother. I don't know. People justify it by some of those quotes. That's all I say. I don't know how, but to themselves and verbalizing it, that's what they'll use. Bishop, and thank you for taking time to speak with us tonight. I know this is a bit of an exaggerated comparison, but um, imagine the government requiring American Jews to eat pork during the High Holy Days. Where do all of these other faiths stand with us? Do they support us? I don't think you exaggerated at all. And I thank you for the, you know, bringing up that point. It's not a true exaggeration. Where do they stand? Um, within the state of Florida is what I can speak of most clearly because that's my experience. But um, the Baptists probably are, are with this, with us on most of this and that I know. And that's a large population in Florida. Um, so in terms of what happened, they see the difficulty on how it could begin to cut at some of their things. Um, some of the more orthodox Jewish leaders uh, also had sympathy for our position. Okay, um, the you know the Jews have, and they themselves use the the categories of orthodox and liberal and all of this. It primarily among the orthodox Jewish community. Um, you know, I think we have a a society today that goes a lot. Um, you know, each each to their own. We're very individualistic, and so there was not. You had strong leaders of some communities speak out on this, but you didn't have whole communities get behind the leader on the issue. I, I hope that answers your question, but I don't have a, lead, a lot of evidence to say, okay, this whole group is here. been very kind to me tonight with it. I, I can honestly say I believe my brother bishops to a T. I don't know anyone who doesn't stand where I stand on this issue or what I've said or written. Uh, I know some who maybe different degrees of articulating and acting it out and doing it, but I would say that they're there. Uh, I understand what you say about family members who you know, I, I said it was from Wisconsin. I have a whole kind of family up there, not immediate, but a little bit extended. Uh, their teachers and things like this, oh, they don't agree with some of the positions I'm saying. Uh, they're all Irish Catholics, just like I was raised, same part of the country. Um, it's different. Um, I don't know what accounts for that. You, you talked about a, a minority, as we are a minority, you spoke about another one. It's a minority that, delivers their whole group, huh? delivers. Uh, they're told, and you go this way, uh, another aspect is they economically work together. We saw what happened when Chick-fil-A said something. Whoa! And I don't know about you, but I went that day when everyone was supposed to be told about it. I got that with you. I love fried chicken and stuff. <laughs> I don't deserve the credit. I went, but really I enjoyed it. But I probably wouldn't have gone. I don't go buy it too much because I do like it too much and I don't need it. But uh, I did go that day and I really thought, man, we have to. It was just like, come on, I'm going. And, you know, okay. Uh, somebody uh, 
or I think his wife is here tonight, was earlier, maybe couldn't stay, but uh, has a good number in the family, took his whole family, they went. And I thought, bravo. But I don't have an answer for you. Really saying, why can't we deliver that vote anymore? And I wish we could. And I, I know that when that cardinal closed that, those Catholic schools, all the parents, that was fine, take the kids over. They understood what was being done, and I'm sure a number of them were walking pretty close because they wanted to make certain their children were safe, like parents today. But we don't have that ability. We've become more diverse. Maybe because it's said we need to be more accepting. We need to be, let's face it, I spoke of the 70s earlier. I'm not certain it was a good thing. Okay, I lived through it, did it all. Sometimes, like I'm on a university campus somewhere today, and you see a lot of the, well, that's 60s for me, really. Uh, you know, dress the way we were and everything like that, and I think, this just isn't good. Because I'm not certain it delivered a real positive result in the end. But what I do want to say is, no, we don't deliver. I think the Catholic population um, is very diverse, um, and it's not delivered as a block anymore. It's looked at always as a voting block, because that's the way it was, right? I don't think it is anymore. I'm going to say one other thing that <clears throat> I hope it doesn't alarm you, it shouldn't surprise you, but I'm going to say it. Um, Catholic clergy will reflect the Catholic society that we have. Okay? Um, I, I maybe don't like to say that, I maybe, maybe you don't like to hear it, and maybe we shouldn't be surprised, because that is where it's rising up. I think you see something different among, and, and vocations are growing. Uh, we ordained two men last spring. We'll ordain two men this Saturday. We have others coming next spring to be ordained. Vocations are increasing again. Um, the younger priests are a little bit different. There's a change from like the age group. Um, it, it cuts two ways. I hear some. The other way, I just have to say that the, it, but there is a change going on. I don't know where it's going to settle, okay? But it puts lots of, I think, challenges for everyone in that sense. Certainly for a seminary faculty, you know, on how to prepare them. And you know, is it a more militant type thing? Is it a more inclusive? We we went through a training where you know, be open, be inclusive, and okay. We need to all respect other human beings without a doubt, but we need also to respect who we are and who, what our tradition is, and who do we represent. And you know, it's, uh, it's not a nine to five job, and, and it can't be, and if that happens, it's never gonna work. Um, so I think we're seeing some changes. Where it's gonna settle or where it's gonna lead to, that I don't have the conclusion. That crystal ball broke a few years ago. <laughs> for having this, and I have a kind of a two-part question. Um, we talked a lot about the HHS mandate as being a attack on attack on religious liberty, um, and I agree with you that there seems to be a slippery slope going on in our country. Um, everything from Catholic orphanages having to close down because they won't adopt the gay couples to you see like the California Supreme Court just decided that uh, parents can no longer choose what kind of therapy their kids can take to you know, the New York school system is now giving contraceptives and abortive kits to students without parental authorization. And as a parent, it's very worrisome to me because the parent is on my parental rights, but also to me, it feels like an attack on religious liberty. And I would like to know your stance on all these other things that are happening that seem to be an attack on religious liberty other than the HHS mandate, which is so blatant, you know, you can't ignore it. These seem so much more under, um, you know, behind the scenes that it's easy to ignore. Um, and also, in light of this, how can we be happy warriors? Because I don't feel like going to Mass, I mean, I pray about it and I go to Mass, and, you know, when we have the rallies, I went, but I feel like there's not a, I feel like it's not enough, there needs to be more than we're doing, but I don't know what to do. And, I mean, I, I feel like, you know, if we're supposed to be fighting for our religious liberty, I mean, what can we do as Catholics um, to be peaceful, at the same time, stand up for our rights. 
What, why did I say the happy warrior, warrior part earlier? Because I think we have to be a people of faith, and, and Christ is going to fill us with a certain amount of joy. It must, or we're not realizing what's happening to us. At the same time, we have to be willing to respond to, uh, well, let's take your example about contraceptives being passed out in school. Um, I don't think that same nurse will give an aspirin to a child without your permission. <laughs> Somebody. But they can't get Tylenol without, without a doctor's note, but they can give them plan B without prescription. Uh, give them the abortion pill, give them contraceptives. I mean, I mean, yeah, and in, in schools, that's the situation now. Um, the other thing is, and we were all that age at one time, but I think it's parental. You asked about religious rights. I really think it's about parental rights here. Parents are the, and the church has always said, are the first and the best educators of their children. And it particularly related to matters of faith and morals. Let's face it, that's who knows their child. And the child knows and trusts the parent. It looks to them. You get to a certain age, I know, uh, I remember, like when, you know, you're in school and, and mom decides she's going to tell the teacher something. You're like, mom, please don't do it. But, um... I just think parents, younger parents particularly, yourselves and your friends, you've just got to go in and say we don't agree with this. There has to be, other people have opted out and have chosen homeschooling to move away from that. Um, okay, and that, that is an option. I think in, in my day, I didn't know anybody who was homeschooled. I really didn't. Kids, and maybe there was, I just didn't know anybody. Now there's a lot, and there's a network. Um, and lots of people come up with like, that won't work, that won't be this. I've seen some fairly good products come out of home schools, whether it's socially, academically, spiritually, lots of things. Okay, that same individual who's not a child at some point when they grow up needs to be introduced vis-a-vis -vis these things are out there. They're there. But they've heard it explained to them by a parent who loves them and is doing what is the best for them overall, not the best for, you know, this is what everybody does or how to do it. But I do think we have to speak up. We have to elect officials. I think we don't pay enough attention either to who's elected to the school board. And who's going to run, who's going to run, get together, and, you know, run for the county school board. Find somebody and, you know, couple of you run, somebody's going to win. <laughs> you know, all right, it takes a little money, somebody will support you, but we don't pay enough attention. And then to speak up and say, no, 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 this is out in our schools. No, you don't do that. Because what, you know, bothers me, the other thing is kind of a Amendment 6 that we have going. I'll just hold this little thing up at this point. I've got to get the commercial in. Amendment 6, parental rights. How does the parent find out in some cases when this happens? Hospital calls for approval of the bill. And now you know that your daughter is having abortion. That's how you learn. How terribly sad. Uh, at least to me, I feel terribly sad for the young lady. I really do. And for the parents. And for the parents. Um, so these are the kinds of things I'm talking about that, uh, you know, they can't, that title and all has to have the approval of somebody, but um, no, not for an abortion, no, not for the other things that they're, they're being taught. Or described to, and I think it used to be you kind of opt the students out. I don't even know if you can do that anymore in some of these programs. Sure. Okay. Here in town, here in town, I say it's mostly up in Sarasota because Planned Parenthood is very active there, and they have a huge facility. If you haven't seen it. And I go to some events and they know who I am, I know who they are. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes I'll say hello and they just run the other way. Because, okay, I think you have to dialogue and talk. I don't agree with anything they do. They say me is absolutely, totally against them. And I am about everything they stand for. But I do think you have to dialogue and talk. But when I try, they kind of run away. So, but I keep trying. Thank you, Bishop. Um, elections are important. 
these meetings are important. Thank you for helping us with this. But my question is, what is our strategy going forward? I hear there are some individual lawsuits of smaller groups. What I don't hear is that there is a concerted, focused, legal challenge to this fundamental attack on our human rights. What is the next step, Bishop, that we are going to take as an organization? Okay, I, I think on the HHS mandate, if I could just say, there is a coordinated, orchestrated, legal approach to fight it. Now, uh, I think you heard X number of entities all at one time file suits. Maybe you noticed like, Diocese of Venice was not part of it. Okay, diocese throughout the country. Uh, I shouldn't come as a surprise to you, that was strategically done. Judge, you know, it took a time, it was out there for a while. They looked at who were the judges in the area, what kind of, because you need mixed decisions. This is going to go to the Supreme Court, and you need the decision. That was strategically done. That was sat down, we need it here, we're going to go here to this district, here, here. Then you had a whole series of universities who came up. In, in the area, Ave Maria has filed a lawsuit. Um, then you had businessmen who strategically, and that was like the third wave that came, they filed individuals who are Catholic and saying, you know, I, I don't feel I should have to pay this in my business. You know, I, di I disagree with it. So there was that. Those, they're a small number. But continually, the other day I saw that the uh, Diocese of Nashville is filing it. Um, I don't know why. Uh, but, okay, obviously somebody decided that uh, a ruling will come from a judge there that will help this move toward the Supreme Court. So there's truly an orchestrated legal aspect there. Um, I spoke about this case in Missouri where the judge talked about uh, the mandate. There's been other local cases that have ruled very favorably in the direction we would like a ruling like that to go. Um, who just simply said, you know, this, this isn't strange. I, you have to look to, there was something about, um, and I'm not a trained civil lawyer, canon law I've done, but it said, um, it's called Tabor, and I forget who was suing whom, it was a hiring procedure for hiring teachers. And in the end, it was the unanimous decision of the Supreme Court, Federal Supreme Court right now, that said, no, institutions have a right to, you know, a Catholic institution can hire who it wants. And they can say you have to be Catholic. Uh, it's a part of who they are. Now, if they can do that, it's been taken that that decision was close enough to what we would be looking at in terms of the HHS mandate uh, and the legal decision that maybe we, we have a good chance there. But on this one, you're right, sometimes we're not as coordinated as we should be. I'll grant you that whole argument. On this one, we might be. Okay, I pray we are. Uh, I'm a, thank you for coming. This has been very helpful. I have two comments before I ask a question. Um, first, another option to homeschooling is we've got some of the best Catholic schools in the nation right in this area. That's true. Okay, and, that's true. Uh, and I promise you, we will not do the things that are happening at the public schools. Um, and then the second... You know, I'm just going to say, I know we don't do that in our schools, so that's why. <laughs> okay. And the other thing, uh, I know I've heard some comments that we're not hearing enough of this on the pulpit. Uh, Father John Fitch has been very bold and has done an outstanding job. Uh, one thing that I've been hearing a lot in, in my circle of friends is that uh, the greatest um, uh, weapon against socialism is the Catholic Church, and they know it. And they know that the Catholic Church is what's keeping this country from being a socialist com uh, country. And so therefore, we are at war, that they do want to destroy us, and that one of the best weapons that they have is to divide and conquer. And they are surrounding themselves with what I consider are Catholic traitors, because they do not practice the Catholic And as people that, you know, feel as strongly as 
you know, and argue with the Catholic say, what do you say we can do to help counter that? Because we are at war. And the more people realize it, the more they're, they're going to start joining the battle. Regar regarding particularly that point uh, about someone saying, well, I'm Catholic and I don't believe that, or I'm Catholic and I'm not going to do that, um, try and draw it out a little bit more and then suddenly say, no, you're not Catholic. No. You might think you are, you are not. You may have been baptized, and that's the, if you want to say, the chip that's played. Um, you know, we, uh, I haven't used any too many political names tonight. Nancy Pelosi is probably the, the most brazen. I'm sorry. Um, you can't do all these things and say all these things and then say, you know, I'm a good practicing Catholic. Come on. Um, I don't say that I'm perfect, and I'm nerdy, but, but don't try and stand up and say that then. You know, um, they have to be called out. And I'm going to say one thing, and this could have, I know the bishops have a responsibility to do it, and I accept that. But so does everyone else. And sometimes the most strategic way, whether it's Sibelius or Pelosi or somebody, uh, if I do it, you know what they're going to say. With the dog collar on, of course he's going to do it. You know, it's going to come at us, and it does. If a woman stands up to her and says, you are not who you say you are, because I know what that means, that is much more powerful. And I just, I'm not trying to pass the buck. Don't misunderstand me. I just think sometimes we need to think a little bit strategic when you want, God, Bishop, get up there, you know. But it's not the best way to do it. It's going to get dismissed. And you get, so, you get so many punches, you know that. I, I had a good friend who had three daughters. And I used to, of course I was a great critic, huh? What do they do, what do you do? And he said, listen Frank, you get only so many battles. And you win some and you lose some. You get only so many battles. And who's going to stand up and do it? And I just think sometimes in the past we have not done that strategically well. Um, there was a woman who a long time was the uh, spokesperson at the uh, Bishop's Conference on pro-life. Her name was Helen Alvarez, um, Cuban-American, uh, absolutely beautiful person. She could get on these talk shows and she was just perfect because uh, she had an image, she was quick, she was bright, trained lawyer, knew how to debate, and just went at him. And he would start out and everything was very sweet and you think, oh, she's going to get killed. All of a sudden she just kicked in. And, um, that is what we need, I think, a lot of times, because, you know, I'll just be very blunt, particularly on the issues that relate to women. Father can stand up there and speak, you want, I can stand up there. A whole different opinion when another woman stands up and says, this is what, you know, I am a woman, and this is what I believe. This is who I am. And where, is so I stand up and say, what does he know? Go ahead. Some of you probably get it. Well, I have to get up a little early tomorrow with you. <laughs> Thank you for coming, Bishop. Uh, I came, I've been coming to as many of these talks as I can, and when I came to Patrick Madrid's talk, he came early enough to go to 4 o'clock mass. Father John Fitch gave a homily that I thought was the best thing that I wish went out to every Catholic church in the nation. And he started out and he said, I'm not a Republican, I'm not a Democrat. Catholic. And he went on to give some reasons how the, the, the philosophies of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party changed over the years. But I think the message that the Catholic Church needs to get is we are Catholics and as Catholics we believe these fundamental things on what's going on in society today. The abortion is killed. And, and point out to people the paragraph numbers in the Catechism says if you support abortion, you're excommunicating yourself. These type of messages I think we can get, get out. Thank you. Would the church ever consider civil disobedience and just refuse to follow the mandate? One of my brother bishops asked me what I thought about that, and I said, listen, um, I go regularly into the prisons and jails in my diocese. I don't have a problem staying there a couple nights either. <laughs> I, 
I, I, I suppose I need, I don't think it would be something looked too flippantly, and by that I mean, um, you know, because it, 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 would, it would not be a positive thing for our country, for our church, for no one. But however, sometimes if you're forced into a corner, I think the statement must be made. And while there would be many opposed, there would be a lot to say, you know, what are we doing? You know, and I think their jails are pretty full anyway, so I don't know. Thank you, Bishop, for coming tonight. I also uh, want to thank you and all the Florida bishops for putting together that 2012 uh, position guide. It's the first time I think the diocese has really put together a comparison of positions. And uh, we appreciate it. I have a favor to ask you here, though, and that is uh, I have gone, there are 50,000, over 50,000 Knights of Columbus in the state of Florida, and I have gone to ask them to get behind this and have been turned down twice by the state. Uh, council and saying that they don't want to get involved in this. It's between me and my priest or me and my diocese. But they are an army of folks. I was hoping that you at least could uh, maybe get the word out to them and at least in our diocese uh, get the Knights of Columbus behind all of this. Thank you. Um, okay, I think that the Knights in the diocese have been pretty good. I don't know where you were. I heard of one group, I'll just be very honest about this, who the group said no, they weren't going to get involved in any of this the six and the eight, uh, I called the head of the state knights and said, I don't understand this, could you explain it? He said, Bishop, don't worry, I'll take care of it. Uh, it was it was resolved. I, I, I think it was just some one individual who didn't agree with it, and, you know, I think the lady behind you posed the question, not all the Catholics are of the same party, so somebody disagreed and wasn't going to do it. But the knights were behind it, so in fairness, I have to say, my understanding, the Knights in the state, and nationally, by the way, nationally, the Knights have helped us with the six and eight campaign. So I, we really can't criticize them. I don't feel we can too much. A few individuals might have gone astray. Uh, thank you, Excellency, for coming today. Uh, we appreciate all that you've done. And my question. Uh, goes in a slightly different direction. In addition to all these current events that you have spoken and written about recently, you've also written a lot recently this past year about the power of prayer, devotion to our Blessed Mother, and I wonder if, um, since unless the Lord builds a house, it will not stand, if you could just expand a little bit on the importance of prayer during this time and fasting and almsgiving, and also any events that may be taking place that we can participate in, in addition to our own efforts at prayer um, for this good cause. On the points you mentioned about prayer, fast, and almsgiving or, or sacrifice there, um, in Scripture we also find, you know, when, when nothing works, what do you do? Well, you pray and you fast. And uh, it's a tradition, I kind of said, we don't talk about evil anymore. We don't talk about fasting too much either. Um, so uh, we need to look about that. But it's kind of what I made earlier when I said the happy warrior. Uh, if we're praying and, and if we're communicating with the Lord and people, I think we're going to be happy. We know we have a struggle, but we're going to be that happy uh, warrior who's out there. So um, I have written about it. I, I, I believe very much in my life's power of prayer. I, um, I just don't want to get into the examples, but I just say for me, prayer is very important. And we just, when there's difficult times and it's not that everybody has to know that, you know, somebody's spending hours and hours over in the chapel. We just have to pray. Uh, when you're in your car, and talk to the Lord about your intentions, the struggles you have, but the struggles we have as a faith group too. What we have to do and how we can go about doing it. Um, thank you for the comment, because sometimes I wonder if anybody reads that. <laughs> so, I appreciate it. <laughs> I do not go to Mass here. I belong to one of the other parishes. But hanging in the foyer of the uh, church is that beautiful banner from the uh, bishops of Florida that lists the, the values and the criteria that we should look at to vote in, in our candidates. Do you have any plans to write a pastoral letter close to the election 
reiterating those, that criteria, and urging your fellow Catholics to vote their Catholic values. Um, I've done a series of letters kind of the last couple weeks in the paper that comes out every two weeks, the Florida Catholic, the diocesan uh, part of it. I will do one more right that will come out right before the election, and then we will do a letter that will go into the bulletins throughout all the parish, the diocese, at the end. Am I going to write a, a pastoral letter? As I understand your use of the term. I probably have to say no to that. You want to call? In my church bulletin, all of your letters are printed so tiny that I have to get out a magnifying glass to read them. It is a real struggle. I am talking about a letter to be read by the church, by the pastor preferably, from you. I'm asking if you have any plans to do that, and if you do not, I'm asking you to consider doing it. Okay, I hear you. Um, I think I did, um, too, since I've been here as bishop, read out loud. Um, I can do that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bishop. Um, first of all, I have a couple comments to make, so I want to do. Um, most of the elderly folks vote Democrat because they think they're for the um, poor people. The Hispanics think the same way. They think because they're for the poor people, this is why they're voting for them. And so somebody in the diocese explains it a little bit different, it's not going to be heard. The other thing is, I think we've been dormant. Um, a lot of us have put God in the back burner, or we put him on somewhere outside. And I think maybe this is God's way of saying, okay, now, now that this is all happening, we're all coming back to prayer, we're all coming back to the church, we're coming back together. And they say that sometimes an evil happens so something good can come out of it. Maybe this is what had to come out of it. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. I have a comment. This is probably the biggest and most important election in my lifetime. And when we get together in social and, and the family, we say we don't want to talk about politics and religion. Well, much of the angst of my kids and some of the people I know, I've put that aside. And I hope everyone here, it's getting pretty close and it's too late for big organizations. We need to be one-on-one -on -one with people and be very upfront. They've got to vote the right way. The other question is, or I'm looking for some factual information. I've been gone for six months, and I'm confused when I read what I got in the mail is a sample ballot of all these amendments. Some of that language is confusing. I'd like to find a source to which way I'm supposed to vote. I don't want to make the wrong vote because some of that language is frankly very confusing. As we're willing to go for nowhere yet. <laughs> <laughs> Those two I can help you. I I'm going to turn uh, kind of to to this Bob Reddy, who's our media person. I think Gene is still here. On the amendments, I think there's nothing out per se, but six and eight, what we have done. Is that correct, Gene? The church has not taken a stand on any of the other amendments. There are some sources, if you go to the internet, uh, you can find out a lot more about the other amendments. There are some sources, there's one in particular that is out there. Uh, unfortunately, they, they tried to be as biased as possible and give both sides, but they still didn't make it all the way on six and eight. That's why we're not recommending that particular site. We certainly don't want to confuse people anymore than they already are confused. 
But uh, if you want to see me later, I can help you a little bit maybe with that. I think we'll start to wrap it up. Some people need to go. We'll take that last question there and over there. Uh, thank you, Bishop. Uh, back in the 70s, uh, uh, the Diocese of Springfield, Massachusetts, uh, was trying to revert, re reverse the Roe versus way the, the abortion uh, issue. And we had mass mailings and telephone uh, mailings too that were passed out at and all, and all the masses, and that you would petition either state, either state legislators or congressmen, uh, federal and, and uh, senators, to really flood, flood numerically uh, uh, these uh, uh, legislators, whoever they may be. And it was done well, uh, re repeatedly, and I thought it was a, a great idea. I don't. I don't see that anymore happening, and it stopped it. And uh, I, I'd like to see it back. In other words, here's who you call, and, and here's who you send it, and call, and mass number just flood every day. Okay, I hear you. We did that. Um, if you remember, I think it was four years ago or two years ago, on Amendment 2. That, that was the amendment to put into the Florida Constitution that marriage was between a man and a woman. We did that here, we did part of it through cards and mass mailing to, to legislators, but it was done in a vote in the end, and it received the threshold of 60%. By the way, all the amendments at 6 and 8, it's important you talk to your friends because if it is an amendment to the Constitution, it just doesn't have to get a majority, it has to get 60% of the vote. Um, and, you know, that's a pretty high threshold sometimes, but, okay, I hear you on that. We have used it. Um, we'll see, a Roe versus Wade is still out there, unfortunately. Um, doesn't mean that that didn't have an impact. It just means that we have to keep going at it. A lot of people, even legal people, talk about how it is a bad decision. Even legally, it's not written well. So we'll see, um, and we have heard some politicians who are running for the higher offices and they can talk about it and address it fairly directly. Um, Planned Parenthood puts uh, tons of money behind it. Um, they're the main opposition on 6 and 8, and it's running around $2 million that they've spent. Last question. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you very much uh, for your courage and the courage that Cardinal Dolan started this whole thing with. We are very, very enamored by him, particularly when he went to the Democratic Convention and spoke after they three times tried to take God out of their platform. And, and then in turn, we have a candidate now who said the other day, I believe in God. And he, he took a lot of courage for him to say that in front of the world. And then in turn, we are now have a lot to fight for, bubbling over right now. We had Father Fitch come up routinely, Father York come up routinely and support your cause and everybody's cause here and we are so blessed to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank all of you for being here this evening. I don't want to keep it any longer because you have other commitments I have to get home. But just to, to thank you for your interest, for your presence, for what you've said and asked this evening. Um, it gives me some ideas and things that I know we have to follow up on. I want to thank the priests for what I heard also to publicly thank you. I just got to tell you, you know, the priests are supposed to have humility, so don't get carried away too much. <laughs> but no. Thank you, uh, fathers, for the work that you do here. Um, and the whole staff here. I want to thank them for welcoming this whole series and setting it up here at Epiphany Cathedral. And it wasn't me who had anything to do with it. People thank me. It's them who had everything to do with it. So thank you.